The merciless wild. The heartless seas. When nature unleashes her cruelty, could you escape? Could you survive? These are the true stories of outdoorsmen confronted by death, armed with raw courage and a will to live. They are the ones who beat the odds and return from their own fight to survive. Father-son adventurers trek deep into the treacherous Alaska wilds. Cliff areas looked pretty uh, chancy. Following the rugged trail of the white-coated doll sheep, before the hunt is over, one man will witness his son windmilling helplessly through the air from a cliff. I'm not sure he's gonna keep breathing. His help's coming. We have a serious situation. And that man will learn the outer limits of strength, endurance, and commitment of which a father is capable. The spectacular wilds of Alaska's mountains, an ideal place for a hunter to pass from wilderness to wilderness, from one high place to another, in the words of John Muir. But those high places come with extreme risk. A misstep, a patch of ice, or a sliding rock can hurdle a hunter to the bottom of a gorge. Growing up a hunter in Texas, Rick Collins was willing 30 years ago to accept the risks of Alaska for its breathtaking wild spaces, twice as large as those of his native state. Well, I uh, moved to Alaska in 1983. It's been several years and uh, I haven't grown tired of it a bit yet. And I came because of the outdoor life, the mainly hunting, but fishing as well. Uh, I like the wilderness situations of being able to get away from the crowds. That'd be a good trip this year, Jake. Came here mostly for the adventure. August 18th, 2006. Collins and his 22-year-old son, Jake, his main hunting partner, set off for their favorite doll sheep hunting area, the sheer cliffs of the Wrangell Mountains. Getting to doll sheep territory starts with a six-hour drive across the state from their home in Wasilla. Then, a long slog on ATVs up muddy 4x4 tracks in the late summer thaw. We started running into muddy conditions, uh, difficulty finding our way through bogs. We knew early on that we were going to be spending the night somewhere along the trail. Covered up. When they have to leave their ATVs, they conceal them to prevent bears from destroying them. Yeah, the frame of mind at this point is uh, things are going well. We were confident, and our confidence was growing that we were going to be able to find sheep. A couple of hours after daylight, which here can come at 2 or 3 in the morning, the two are out of their spike camp and beginning to see sheep and to find a place to set up their spotting scope to glass the far slopes and ridges. Oh yeah, there, there's one. We did convince ourselves that there were some legal rams in the group, although fairly high up the mountain. The two spot sheep, but not the trophies they're hoping for. But young Jake is ready to settle for something that at least qualifies as a legal ram and wants to strike out after one. And Collins reasons that he might as well. So I said, well, it's getting late enough in the day now that where those sheep were, I'm sure I can't make it up there and back by dark. So if you want to go get one of those sheep, I'll stay behind down here by the creek and just monitor you through the spotting scope as you go up. Collins glasses son Jake with his spotting scope as the young man makes the steep climb to get in range of sheep. Collins is confident in his son's abilities, but wants to keep him in sight just in case. Now, we can tell from the valley floor that the cliff areas along this bottom of this ridge trying to get up out of the bowl looked pretty substantial, pretty uh, chancy. But of course, from that far away, no real clear indication of how steep they were. And then once he started the climb, I could tell from the way he was having to use both hands, uh, make a few backtracks, and, and uh, try 
tried different routes going up that it was a little more steep country than I had anticipated it was. So I could tell that was pretty tough stuff to get up through, and I was glad I wasn't having to get up through it. As Collins watches, Jake seems to have spotted something out of Collins's line of sight, and it looks like he might be moving into position for a shot. I saw him stop. I saw him look over that direction, and I couldn't see any animals over there. But then he started making his way over to that edge of the ridge. And then I saw him getting his gun ready. So I figured there were obviously some sheep over there that looked more attractive to him than the ones we'd seen before. And then eventually, he took a shot. When he shot, yeah. I saw a sheep appear falling off to further to the left across that gorge. Uh, and so I knew he had gotten a sheep. I saw him stand up and hold his arms over his head like, yeah, he got one. Woo! I got it! It's been a successful hunt for Jake, but the full celebration will have to wait until he finds a way down to the ram and then packs it out. Alaska's strict hunting regulations require that all edible meat must be retrieved from the field for human consumption. Then uh, he started walking up and down the edge of this cliffs area from this ridge uh, looking for a way down. Collins grows uneasy as he watches his son trying to find a safe way down the treacherous chutes of the gorge to the sheep. Yeah, I started getting worried about it because I could see that there was no clear way down for him. I thought he might be considering uh, doing something pretty drastic. And then I see him squat down and obviously take a posture like he's going to jump. So then I'm really getting worried. Then I see him turn around and face the mountain and grab the ledge. His hand slipped off the ledge and he falls over backwards and uh, disappears out of my sight. The realization came rather sudden that we have a serious situation. I don't know how serious, but I have to get to it. Jake Collins has fallen, and now his father must draw on a lifetime of outdoor experience and the sheer power of his will to save his son. Hunting on their own, Deep in Alaska's Wrangell Mountains, Father Rick Collins has watched his son Jake hurtle off a cliff into a gorge. Now, Rick Collins must find a way to rein in his horror and concentrate on his son. Collins pulls himself together. With three hours to nightfall, he has to pack up rescue supplies and climb up to learn his son's fate. Yeah, I know it's gonna take me a while to get to there. I haven't seen him. I have only my imagination to think about what uh, condition he's in. Don't know if he's got broken legs, broken arms, if he's conscious, if he's not, if he's bleeding, if he's not. No way to know. Just grab what I could and started that direction. Collins is beyond the range of any cell signal. He has no satellite phone or radio to call out on. A more serious hindrance is his age, as he has to drive his 53-year-old legs to carry him up the slopes at top speed. About every 15 to 30 minutes, I'd have to stop for a rest. Jake. And every time I stopped, I'd just start yelling, uh, Jake, I'm headed up there, just in case he was in a position where he could hear me. The terrain grows only more steep and rugged. But the most difficult and ominous part is the silence. Collins receives no answers to his repeated shouts to his son. My frame of mind Jake. is that if I'm getting close to him, he's probably not hearing me. And if he's not hearing me, it's probably because he's not conscious. Collins presses on, legs and lungs burning. And then, without warning, he sights his son, lying motionless. Collins plunges into the gorge to reach Jake. When I got to him, he obviously wasn't conscious. I was talking to him the last five feet or so as I approached him. I kind of grabbed his shoulder and uh, said again, Jake, are you, can you hear me? And he, uh, his eyes opened and he kind of looked up at me, but I could tell there was 
just a blank stare, no recognition in his eyes. And he just closed his eyes and went back to complete unresponsiveness. Rick does a quick exam and doesn't feel any broken bones. But Jake's head is full of Jake. cuts. Jake, can you talk to me? Collins considers trying to carry Jake out, but knows that's impossible in this terrain. My next option is, am I going to go to camp to go down there and come back? I know it's going to take me two hours at very minimum because it took me an hour to get to him. I don't think that's a good idea because uh, I'm not sure he's going to keep breathing any length of time, much less for two hours. So I decide that, OK, I'm just going to stay with him with what I have. And what he has is some parachute cloth to make an emergency shelter for his son and him. So I had this with me that I knew I could cover us up with. I felt like he was off the rocks well enough that it was a good way for us to spend that first night and me to make sure he keeps breathing. Collins beds down for the night beside Jake under the parachute cloth, sharing his body warmth and making sure his unconscious son continues breathing. Collins has to fight the gusting frigid wind all night, but in the late hours, things take an even more chilling turn. Then sometime after midnight, he started having seizures uh, where he would uh, start to stiffen up and he would even start to kick his legs up. They would only last about a minute and then go for anywhere from 15 minutes to a half hour before he would have another one and that continued for a couple hours. I'd say by three to four in the morning, those had stopped. Sleep is impossible for Collins as he monitors Jake's condition and lying beside his son, he searches through the rescue options. So I'm just thinking back and forth whether I'm gonna leave him in the morning or whether I'm gonna stay to some point when I know I have to leave. He hadn't stopped breathing throughout the night, so that's further confirming to me that as soon as it gets daylight, I'm gonna need to cover him up as best I can and go find help because nobody's gonna find us where we are. Rick builds a rock wall to protect Jake from tumbling debris and covers his eyes to shield against scavenger birds. Collins has done all he can. Now he must abandon his son, even if only temporarily, Jake, if Jake's help. life is to be saved. Rick Collins is cheering the sight of his son Jake, taking a doll sheep ram, when the scene turns to one of horror as he sees his son falling helplessly into a deep gorge. Having stayed with an unconscious Jake through the chill Alaska night, as the injured boy suffers seizures, Collins makes the agonizing decision to leave his son in order to go for help. As you imagine, it's a, a major decision for me to actually turn my back on him and start to walk away. That was a very difficult thing to do. I, I knew that was the right thing to do. I was convinced that I had to leave him, but it took me, I think, three tries of actually turning around before I actually made myself keep walking away from him. Rick Collins doesn't have time to look back at Jake. He's got to move as fast as his legs can carry him back to their spike camp, then on to the ATVs in the desperate hope of finding help for his son. An hour later, he reaches their spike camp, then two more hours to the ATVs. But the thawed trail onward is a swamp of mud and muck, and Collins has to winch and muscle the 4x4 out of the bog holes when it gets stuck. Got stuck. Uh, 10 to 12 times probably going out where I had to get off the four-wheeler, then use either the winch or me coaxing the rig along, standing off to the side and using both the engine power and me pulling on it to get it out of the muck. Finally, Collins reaches his truck. He has a choice of a short trip to an isolated ranger station or a longer ride to an area he remembers seeing rental cabins. And I decided to take the chance and go with what I was relatively sure there's going to be some form of communication at a lodge. So I head that direction. 
away from the ranger station and within three or four miles come to I see a cabin up ahead, a recreational cabin on the left. So I pull into that cabin, go knock on the door, and somebody answers the door, and I ask uh, if he knows of how I can get uh, in touch with emergency services to ask for a rescue. Collins' good Samaritan drives him back to where they can get cell service, and they call an Alaska State Trooper dispatcher in Glen Allen, a hundred miles away. The dispatcher puts through a swift chain of calls, and a rescue helicopter is in the air from the coolest National Guard Air Force Base in Anchorage. For more than 24 hours, Jake Collins has lain unconscious after hurtling off a cliff. Now, his father boards the rescue chopper, wondering if they will find his son again before it's too late. For more than 30 grueling hours, Rick Collins has traveled muddy trails in search of help for his unconscious son. Now the rescue has gone tactical as they chop her back in high winds to try to locate the gorge in which the fallen Jake Collins lies. They gave me a handheld laser light and asked me to point towards the gorge I recognized as the one Jake was in. The terrain around Jake is too tough for a cable rescue. So Rick Collins and the two-man rescue team must bail out of the helicopter and reach Jake on foot. So they decided then that the two para-jumpers and myself were going to have to get out of the helicopter and hike back to where he was um, and then carry him out to a location where he could be retrieved by the cable hoist. Collins worries that a critical hour has now been added to the rescue effort for his son. Collins presses uphill as fast as he can. But fortunately, one of the para-jumpers with him, Red Reddington, takes off at top speed and outraces Collins up the slope. I think I hear him. He's just over the top. That was Red. Uh, took off in the lead and made his way up, and he was the first one to reach Jake and heard him breathing against the tarp, actually, before he, he got to where you could see him. Jake! Jake, can you hear me? Jake! So I probably got up to him 15 minutes or so after he got to him, and uh, he was still in the process of getting the tarp ripped away and uh, um, evaluating his condition when we got there. But, well, I know he's still alive then, so uh, that was a real relief to hear that he was alive. And as I got up there, I just sat down by Jake as they worked on him and told him I was glad he hung on. Collins's words are for an unconscious Jake. The young man feels cold to the touch, his breathing labored, and his pulse feeble. Yet he is alive. The three men place him on a canvas litter and begin the rush down the slope, back to where the chopper can reach them. Anchorage Life Flight, 44K32. We're ready for cable. Please lower. It's full throttle to Providence Medical Center in Anchorage. Jake is barely alive, and he's fallen into a coma. It doesn't look good. But then, 20 days after Jake Collins' fall, a miracle. He wakes up, opens his eyes, and speaks two words. Hello, and mom. I didn't know I was in the hospital. I didn't know where I was. And uh, I guess I don't know if it was normal or expected, but my senses seem to not be capable of being alert all at the same time. I have a few spotty memories. I can't see anything, but I can hear people talking to me. Uh, so I don't know if my eyes were closed. Maybe my vision sense just wasn't working yet. I don't know. I had a traumatic brain injury from, from the accident, and the part of my brain that was most affected was not what I refer to as the academic side of my brain. It was the motor part of my brain. I couldn't stand. I couldn't communicate very well. It was... Um, it was like being a baby all over again. I was completely helpless. I had to relearn 
all the functions of being a self-sustaining individual. Doctors tell Jake a full recovery will take more than 10 years, but it's now just six years later. He's married with a family and is a teacher in his home of Wasilla, Alaska. He remembers little about the incident. Jake continues to hunt, and he and his dad have returned to the scene of the accident. The excuse for me to want to go back was to find my rifle, but I really wanted to go back just because it, I felt like I had uh, not completed that hunting trip. That was a lot of emotional healing for me and my father. Being back in the same spot, for me, being able to recapture exactly where it was because my memories of that location weren't great. I got pretty emotional about going back to the spot. I, it you know, brought back unpleasant memories for sure for me to be there, but at the same time, you know, I, I think it was good for Jake to see the spot, it, kind of to bring a closure to it, to say this is something that happened the events passed and I'm moving on with my life, things are getting better. Jake Collins well knows he owes his life to his father. I think uh, my reaction to my dad is gratitude. I think uh, grateful to my dad that I'm here and grateful to my family that for all the support that they gave me for me to be, for me to uh, have the quality of life that I do now.